In Ancient Architecture Part 1, I introduced the thesis that there were two very distinct styles of architecture and construction methods present in the ruins from the Egyptian civilization of antiquity. Succeeding episodes of this series will be taking a closer look at the primary examples of Type II architectural styles extant in Egypt that have so far been discovered. The Valley Temple is situated on the Giza Plateau slightly south and east of the Sphinx. The attribution given by mainstream academics is granted to the Pharaoh Khafre, who reigned approximately 2570 years before the Common Era, mainly because a statue of the Pharaoh was discovered upside down at the bottom of a deep pit filled with trash within the temple enclosure. Khafre is also commonly thought to have commissioned the carving of the Sphinx, since geological surveys have established that the limestone blocks used to construct the Valley Temple were quarried from the pit the Sphinx is situated in. However, John Anthony West was responsible for an effort to use the sciences of both geology and paleoclimatology to pursue a more precise dating of the Sphinx and, by extension, the Valley Temple, according to the evidence present for water erosion in the trench surrounding the Sphinx, as well as the dating of the exposed limestone surfaces of the floor area in the Sphinx trench by both acoustic reflection analysis and nucleide concentration sampling. The conclusions of this study, published in 1991, caused a storm of controversy among mainstream academics, mainly because it set back the time of origin for the Sphinx carving between 5,000 and 9,000 years before the Common Era. Critics of the findings have cited the absence of any archaeological record to support the thesis for an advanced civilization in the Nile Valley prior to 3,000 years before the Common Era and dismiss it on this basis. However, as Robert Schock, the lead geologist in the redating research effort, noted, if my scientific findings do not match your archaeological theories, then your theories need to be adjusted. The temple exterior has been stripped of the majority of its granite sheathing for use in building projects in Cairo over centuries, revealing the heavily eroded limestone core masonry with block sizes of from 100 to 200 tons the size and weight of modern locomotives, and the cornice blocks that used to line the top perimeter are tumbled, broken, and mostly missing. Chris Dunn and I briefly examined a pair of cornice blocks on the north side of the site. Remarkably, the granite sheathing applied to the exterior and interior surfaces long after the original construction have been carved on their backsides to match the contours of the core block's erosion, indicated by the blue borderlines, an amazing feat of craftsmanship, particularly in Aswan granite, which has a hardness much greater than limestone. One must question how this was accomplished, since copper or bronze, the hardest metals available to dynastic Egyptian culture, are completely ineffective against granite. Inside the temple, we see polygonal granite block walls, very carefully fitted so that my finest feeler gauge was unable to slip into the joints. The central hall is filled with rows of granite columns topped by lintel beams. The original granite roofing beams are missing. In the south interior wall, we see more polygonal compound joinery, and the north interior wall has a puzzling feature, a large centrally placed block of very fine grain basalt. The original alabaster flooring is also laid in a random polygonal pattern. Sadly, alabaster is a very soft material and it has not weathered the millennia well. The Egyptian Antiquities Authority has attempted to level the various depressions and broken areas with a crude overlay of cement. Note the wall construction where some blocks are shaped to wrap around the corners as well as be arranged in interlocking polygonal joints. Also, the corner profile is razor straight and very regular. I measured all the corners in the building with a set of radius gauges at varying heights 
and I found that not only were the radii uniform from corner to corner within a millimeter or two, but that every corner has a gradual taper of a few millimeters from the top to the bottom, with a small radius at the bottom and the larger radius at the top. I wondered why this would be, and Chris Dunn remarked that it may well be the effect of tool wear as the radii were cut, starting at the top and ending at the bottom. I also checked the squareness of the granite columns in the hall with a digital instrument, finding some to be very close to 90 degrees and others much less so. But as is evident in the images, the columns had been subjected to a lot of breakage and wear over several millennia, and their surfaces are quite irregular as a result. So in all fairness, it would be necessary to check them at a large number of points and average the results to get a clearer picture of how true they once were. A visual inspection of the entire exterior and interior of the Valley Temple revealed not a single hieroglyph, carving, or instance of iconography, and the rectilinear, geometric, severely angular, and unadorned style sets it apart from all typical dynastic constructions of temples, tombs, or buildings, marking it as clearly type two in form and execution. Adding to this, the possible age of nearly 9,000 years, we are forced to confront the mystery of who built it, how they did it, and why. In Ancient Architecture Part 3, we shall examine the most well-known examples of Type 2 engineering and construction, the Pyramids of the Giza Plateau.